Ladies and gentlemen, just give your immediate reaction. Answer what's best to say to the scenes. Well, what if I think they're all LSD? Though? This was one of many such groups with whom I'd met. Parents seeking an answer. Their common bond was fear. It was reflected in papers. The scenes they had watched all suggested LSD. And this is our culture's anxiety. We have a growing number of parents who think or know that their children are using LSD or are afraid they may be tempted to use it. Now, let's take another look at these scenes and see how they compare with our answers. What are we gonna see now? Most of you thought this was an accident caused by the use of LSD. Some of you even thought it might be a suicide. It was drugs, but not LSD. Her doctor gave her some medication with a warning not to drive but she thought warnings were for other people. Nor is this a suicide induced by LSD or anything else. You might argue about who killed him, the enemy, the society that sent him to war, but one thing is certain, he didn't kill himself. The exotic party with dim lights has nothing to do with LSD. It's one of those desperate suburban affairs where everyone uses alcohol to escape his inhibitions and anxiety. You could almost smell the incense in this one, couldn't you? Well, there isn't any. It's a school dance with adequate supervision. the ambulance? Yes. This one is LSD. A bad trip. There's no question we have reason to view with alarm. But four times out of five our fears are groundless. We're being victimized by alarmists and sensationalism which causes us to look at the world in a distorted way. Times of rapid change produce anxiety and escape from anxiety. 
and parents have been put on the defensive by neighbors, the police, teachers, all of whom equate long hair or being different with drugs. Behind every head of long hair does not look a mind distorted by drugs. Some of the most thoughtful, studious, alert and eager minds belong to our sons and daughters. If they're to become participating members of the world, we must allow them to be apprentice adults and to feel some of the satisfying that make it worthwhile to become an adult. Otherwise, it's only natural they'll run away from unimaginable dangers. Certainly there are dangers. There have always been dangers. But one thing is certain, we cannot help our children if we meet the dangers with hysteria and lies. Lies we tell ourselves, lies we tell to them. LSD. Now let's simmer down. Let's see what we can do. But what are you going to do, Dr. Wright? Dr. Wright? I had met with many such parent groups before, desperately seeking answers. When there was none, the anxiety grew intolerable and the defenses appeared. Most of them already knew the worst about LSD and were frightened. What they wanted to know was how could they get their children just as frightened. They began to describe to each other their frustrations at home in trying to get their children to listen to them. How can you study with all that noise? Daddy. Turns out the racket from downstairs. What did you say? Nothing. I'm trying to get this trig problem. I thought I told you to get a haircut. I had to study for this test. It's always something. Now let me tell you something. Bill has tuned his father out. And where do you think he learned how to do that? He learned it from you, Mr. Jones. From me? Well, not just from you, Mr. Jones. From all of us. We teach them to tune out when we don't listen to them. There's going to be a great big war. They're going to drop animals oh, and we're going to have look, to hide look, the phone. I'm on the phone with Judy, dark. you know. It's really they're going to drop. Tommy, your favorite they're TV they're program's they're on. Tommy, we start on. teaching it to them very young. Go ahead. Oh, no, it's just Tommy. And we never stop. Excuse us, Miss Boston. Do you mind if we ask you a question about the assignment? Yes. Do you think that the writer's implication was that the character was dreaming the whole story? It's established in chapter six that... She's tuned them out, involved with their appearance, not their problems. If nobody listens, not even at home, a kid can feel pretty lost. Oh, that drivel they talk. You make them conceited if you hang in every word they say. Make them think whatever they say is important. What they say is important. Sometimes it might even be a cry for help. Those hippies are at it again. The police arrested eight more last night up on the strip. Oh, Daddy, you're always picking on them. Mary was there and she said they didn't do a thing. It was the police. And it says right here that um, alcohol does more harm to your nervous system. Well, the alcohol lobby doesn't want that known. Stop reading that underground trash and pay more attention to your homework. Oh, come on, darling. I never got good grades and I caught a husband. I'll call you later from the club, dear. Oh, what's the matter with you? Nothing. Can a person have any freedom around here? Freedom. Freedom. That's enough to frighten any parent. Her imagination is running wild. What does Nancy want? Just a minute. Are you going out barefooted? It's hot outside. I don't care what the temperature is. A young lady does not go out in public without her shoes. Nancy was testing. Not consciously, but needfully. She was seeking the freedom to make the small decisions in her life to have a sense of her own self. Okay, I'll wear shoes. But you could worry about clothes for other reasons. Somewhere Mrs. Porter had read that long sleeves were being worn to cover needle marks. When she thought about it, she hadn't seen Josh with bare arms for a long time. She felt both foolish and frightened, but she had to find out. Well, after all, parents are not immune to the anxieties of our age. Mom. Oh, nothing, honey. Good night. But what has happened to the avenues of communication that we must check up on our children in the dark by flashlight? Kids today have no manners, no sense of values. Half of them are long-haired drug addicts. 
You just have to listen to the news or read the papers to see it. Are you going to just listen to the news or are you going to listen to your kids? Dr. Wright, as much as I love Bill and Gina, I've got to say that they are rude and inconsiderate a lot of the time. And sloppy too, especially Bill. What is it you want from them? Do you want to show them off like a new carpet in the living room? Are they just something else you own? Are they individuals? their very own selves, who need you for the very special purpose of teaching them how to become grown-ups. Well, I think that my children have sense enough to leave LSD alone, but how can I be sure when it's so available? One of the foremost authorities on LSD is Dr. J. Thomas Ungerleiter of the UCLA Neuropsychiatric Institute. I want you to hear what he has to say about it. I'd like to share some of my thoughts with you about LSD. The story, particularly of LSD, and also that of any of the drugs of abuse, is really a story of much more. It's a story of the two generations, of those under 30, often called teenagers, teeny boppers, adolescents, or whatever, and those over 30, those of us who are the establishment. For drug usage is a symptom. The story is that of adults' defensiveness, hysteria, scapegoating, frantic passing of laws, and real helplessness. It's also a story of youngsters' rebellion, gullibility, of adverse reactions and felony and misdemeanor convictions. Tragically, the story has caused a tremendous failure in communication between the two generations, which has led to what we call a real generation gap. We've all been pretty helpless. Parents, schools, police, judges, doctors, hospitals, psychiatrists, ministers. There's no simple cause, like being too permissive or too strict or not caring for the kids, nor can one expect each parent to be a drug expert on many different drugs by reading all the literature and having all the right answers. No, no one's to blame. There's no simple answer. No school courses, movies, tranquilizers, nor laws to solve this problem. Rather, we must understand a couple of things about the adolescent, and perhaps that will lead us as well to even understanding some things about ourselves. Now, understanding doesn't mean that we'll be totally permissive. We'll certainly lay down some rules. But what we have to understand first is the adolescent struggles with his sexuality and his angry feelings. There's no time like adolescence where these struggles are more difficult and where one has to work harder to find one's identity in life. Drugs like LSD give the tragic illusion to the youngster that he has no struggles and no problems with sexuality and anger. He can pretend to himself that he doesn't have to explore the world inside himself and the world outside himself. Unfortunately, the youngster who's contemplating taking doesn't tell us about his hang-ups, as we call them, nor does any adolescent, but what he is to test us. He criticizes us and our society the world we've created. And this leads to the second point that we must understand. This is the coexistence in the adolescence of extreme perceptivity and extreme gullibility. His gullibility makes the adolescent swallow the nonsensical hucksterings of any drug prophet who comes along. We could probably sell him Disneyland if we tried. On the other hand, it's his perceptivity which makes the adolescent seemingly such a problem for the rest of us. He criticizes what he sees as being imperfect in our world. And he sees things in the adult world that we would rather he didn't see. He sees the hypocrisies. He sees the stifling of the organization man's individuality. He sees our materialism and often shallow lives. Unfortunately, when he criticizes us, we get defensive. And this is where the generation gap really becomes so large. This is where we really turn off his listening to us. Sometimes we say all drug use is a giant communist plot. Sometimes we advocate censoring the radio stations that play rock and roll songs with words and ideas we don't like. Sometimes we frantically pass laws. But always we're defensive and not willing to admit that the youngster has to help us to create a better world instead of dropping out of the world as we know it with drugs. But adolescence is a time of paradoxes. These kids actually want us to retain control of the home, the classroom, and the campus, and not to panic or to be totally permissive. 
They want to know our ideas, but they don't say, for example, tell me about alcoholism. What the adolescent says instead to test us is something like, alcohol is worse than LSD. Then he watches our reaction. It's so important to let the youngster explore new ideas. For ideas and even rebellion can be good, but not the drug rebellion. Of course, these kids have us in a vulnerable position. We're a drug culture. That's the message at the beginning of the film. It's such a fundamental hypocrisy when we adults tell the youngsters that our drugs, our barbiturates, tranquilizers, and especially alcohol, are good drugs, and that it's their marijuana and LSD that are the bad drugs. What can we do? First of all, I think it's vital that we let people talk about drugs in the schools and at home, because to make talking about drugs forbidden is to make it very exciting. Indeed, I've talked to youngsters who take drugs who would rather be drinking alcohol because they like the effects of alcohol better. But when they're taking the forbidden drugs, they're thinking to themselves, what would mom think if she knew? What would teach think? Whereas they know if they're drinking alcohol and their teacher or parent found out, they'd probably just laugh and say, well, so what? We all drink too. Some of the schools that won't discuss drugs have the worst drug problems. Others, where they're minor drug problems, Treat it like any other of society's difficult problem areas by discussing drugs, not preaching, but letting the youngsters form their ideas based on knowledge. An honest I don't know is okay to tell a kid, but not the big lie. We often rationalize the big lie by saying that it's for the youngster's own good. So, with LSD, we talk of deformed babies, unproven, to scare them. But that's what they don't buy. But let's face it, we can't equate the danger of a youngster rebelling with a very dangerous drug like LSD with the danger to him of long hair, even though we may not like long hair because we can't tell the boys from the girls. And when we read in the paper about a sensational story that this or that drug is either instant happiness or instant death, let's keep our cool, as the kids say. Let's not get uptight, or let's be from Missouri, meaning let's be very skeptical and let's go after the real facts. LSD, let's simmer down. We have to remember, above all, that the adolescents are struggling with their feelings of aggression and sexuality, along with the need to establish an identity. They are rebelling and experimenting sexually, trying to find out who they want to be like, what they want to become as they grow older. Many of them see LSD as offering a magic solution for these struggles. But because the drug helps the adolescent to pretend to himself that he's not rebellious or angry, nor has any sexual needs, it deprives him of the chance to work out his problems at the most crucial time of life. This is the greatest tragedy from LSD. Man's search for El Dorado in a pill continues. LSD will surely become obsolete as other more potent psychedelics are developed. As Dr. Ungerleiter has said, people need to explore their feelings and talk out their reactions. People make us feel so self-conscious about our teenagers. Why, we worry more about what the neighbors have to say than about what's good for our kids. You sound like a hippie, accusing us of saying one thing and meaning another. Ah, uh, but adolescents have always criticized the world their parents made. If you criticize a thing, you don't have to admit you're afraid to grow up and become a part of it. On the other hand, much of their criticism shows honesty and mature perception. They seem to be both childish and wise at the same time. Instead of defending our world, perhaps we ought to invite them in to improve it. Does that mean they can do anything they like? No. Just listen to them. If we listen, if we really listen, if we listen right now when it's important to them, not later on when you've read the papers or when we've washed the dishes or maybe had a minute, if we give them the same respect we'd give a passing stranger, we might be able to get them to return that respect and the interest. We might even get them to hear what we're saying. But what? What are we supposed to say to them? No one can tell you for sure what to say. Every individual is different. Every family knows for itself what's gone on before. But we, we don't even remember what we've done wrong. You don't have to remember. 
There are all the pressures of the outside world, all the pressures of his inner changing adolescent self. Try to concentrate on keeping the channels of communication open. Most kids are essentially moral. They think a great deal about who they are and where they're going. Is a psychedelic trip really worth risking the damage to your minds and your bodies? Well, how do you know, Mom? You've never experienced it. You've never been there. Well, I don't have to have syphilis to know I don't want it. What they crave is our honesty. Well, what about LSD? Lately, the new research has shown that it may affect your unborn children. Do you know that for a fact? No, I really don't. But why take a chance? You know, there's all sorts of jobs going on in research and investigations about LSD. Why not get on that side of the fence instead of being the guinea pigs? Oh, come on, Mom. Oh, you got to kill there. Keep your cool. They heard you. Give the thoughts time to germinate. Growing up isn't easy, but we can help by setting reasonable rules that the kids can help to formulate. 